Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Fifty weeks ago, we started with the Mark cycle. That is the lectionary year where we read the Gospel of Mark in community. And it began in Mark chapter 13 with these words from verse 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in heavens will be shaken and then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Today, we really end the Mark cycle. Next week is Christ the King and then begins Advent. So this is the last Sunday in the Gospel of Mark. And what did we get today? And Jesus came out of the temple and one of the disciples said to him, look teacher, what large stones and large buildings? And Jesus said, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. And then there's talk of wars and earthquakes and famines. We haven't gone very far in the Gospel of Mark at all. We end this year as we began. What has this Gospel been saying to us over the course of the last year? It's interesting, of course, because the Gospel of Mark does not begin in chapter 13, nor does it end there. That's only the way the cycle of readings work in the liturgical year of the church. The Gospel of Mark actually begins in a rather quick fashion. There's no story of the nativity. There's only John the Baptist, and then there is Jesus appearing on the scene. And Jesus says, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. That's actually the point of the Gospel of Mark. That's the thesis statement, as it were, that everything wraps around this expectation of the time being fulfilled and that the kingdom of God has arrived. It has come near. Now, if I would have heard Jesus say that all of those many centuries ago, I would have thought, really? Really? The time is fulfilled? What does that mean? It sounds very mysterious and wonderful. And yet the kingdom of God is about to break loose on the earth, but it doesn't feel that way. It feels like I'm still living in this regular place where we're oppressed by the Roman Empire and our religion is put upon by people who don't understand us and there's no freedom here. We're poor. We're sick, we're lost, God seems to have abandoned us. What do you mean the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near? How do we get from this reality of this really hard, difficult life of suffering to the age to come? Is it that easy, Jesus? Are you just going to stand here and announce it? Well, Mark answers that question in all of the stories that he tells that are to come in the pages of his book, Mark reveals the, the hinge in time, the fulfillment, the leap between the age we know and the age that is to come as the story of God's suffering son. I call this the gloomy gospel. Because if nothing else, we have gone in the last year from one really hard story to another. Stories full of frightening things and loss. Stories of people not understanding who Jesus is or purposely seeming to misunderstand him. Jesus, the suffering one, is the Jesus that we meet in the Gospel of Mark. And so it is today, as we come to the end of the cycle, 
of the year in which we are reintroduced to this suffering son. It centers around a very interesting part of Jewish life. It centers around the temple. Jesus came out of the temple. Clearly, he and his friends have been worshiping there or doing their appropriate duties as good Jews. Jesus came out of the temple, and one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. The temple, the temple is a beautiful place in ancient Israel. It is believed to be the house where God dwells, the place where the Shekinah actually lives. The temple represents God's presence in and among the people of Israel, God's house in Jerusalem. It is a place that is the built representation of that very kingdom that Jesus has just said is coming, has arrived, is very near to us now. It embodies the hopes and the dreams of that kingdom. The temple represented to the Jews God's permanence, God's promise, God's stability among them. And it was so important. The temple was so important to them because they were a people who were held as a client state to Rome. They were an oppressed people. They are at the bottom of the social structure. They are poor. Their goods and their wealth have been stripped of them and taken to Rome. They have nothing, essentially, except for those promises, that presence, all of it in that built space of the temple. The temple is so much to a Jew. It is, it is unthinkable, as Jesus will go on to say, his disciples say, look, what large stones and what large buildings. They're fully expecting Jesus to say, yes, isn't it amazing? And they probably think he's going to say something like, and the kingdom of God is like this temple. But instead, Jesus says, do you see these great buildings? And that's the moment they're all hanging there expecting Jesus to say something remarkable about the presence of God in the buildings and says instead, not one stone will be left here upon another and all will be thrown down. Of all the suffering that Mark has taken us through in this entire book, this is the worst. What the disciples are thinking now is that cannot be. That cannot be. The temple cannot collapse. The temple cannot be thrown down because that means that God will have completely deserted Israel. That's the opposite of the kingdom that Jesus was promising. The unthinkable. And yet, that's exactly what happened. The unthinkable. Because there are two layers to this story in the Gospel of Mark. Mark, of course, is writing about something that happened with Jesus and his followers sometime around the year 33. But Mark does not write this book until the year 70. An entire generation has gone and gone since the time that Jesus actually walked out of those temple precincts and said these words or words much like them to the people who were his, his students. It's not going to be here any longer. It's all going to be cast down. In 70 AD, what seemed like a sort of an insight or a prophetic glance or an impossible, unthinkable thing had become reality. Because that was the year, 70 AD, when the Romans had enough. 
They took a giant army into Jerusalem and they crushed the Jews. And they knocked that temple off of its foundations and took all of its holy artifacts and they stole them and they marched them in a parade back across the Mediterranean Sea and into the streets of Rome, the pagan city. The temple was indeed destroyed. The unthinkable actually happened. And indeed, if you think Mark is gloomy, if I think Mark is gloomy, it's because this entire gospel is written in the middle of a war. The war started in 66 AD when the Jews finally had had enough of the Romans and they revolted against them. And at first, it seemed like they might have won mostly because there were a whole bunch of political events back in Rome that kept the Roman army occupied in other parts of the empire. But once Rome sort of woke up and they realized what was going on out there in Jerusalem, they said, there's no way that we're going to let that stand. We're going to go get them. And that's when they sent that army and they did their worst to the Jews. They did their worst to Jerusalem. And when the Roman army did its worst, it was horrible. Thousands and thousands of innocent Jews were slaughtered in the streets of Jerusalem. Thousands were captured and sold into slavery. And thousands were taken from their homes and exiled into other parts of the Roman Empire. And when they were sent into exile, many of them became sport for Roman arenas. That the Jews were thrown in with lions and they became just another spectacle to be eaten at the pleasure of the Romans. The Jews at this time were being made martyrs as much as those who believed in Jesus were being made martyrs. We were in the same boat with the Jews. This is not a text about Jesus coming out and saying, see this temple, well, it's all going to go down and you're just going to worship in some church after this. This is not a text about the replacement of Judaism with some new religion or some casual thought about a temple just happening to be fall so you can build some new building on its site. No, this is a text that is coming out of the heart of despair when the Jews and the Christians who were Jews and the new Christians themselves, when all of these groups of people were under the heel of Roman oppression, under the will of Rome, so that any second, everything that they believed in, everything they trust, everything they thought, thought was stable and permanent, and everything that expressed the presence of God in their midst, it could all be destroyed by Rome. The unthinkable happened. Mark was remembering something that Jesus most likely said, something that sounded very prophetic in hindsight. But that very thing had become the reality of the first people who ever read this book. It must have shattered them. It must have shattered them. And now, when I read it, when I hold that moment in my own heart and I think of the pain, I know that they can relate to where we are. What have the last 20 years been other than a shattering? the temples and towers that we had built to the permanence of things like capitalism and 
democracy. All will be thrown down. Our banks failed. Our houses sold at a block at the will of mortgage companies. Jobs lost. And now a pandemic. Three quarters of a million people dead. We never thought that was going to happen to us. We had beat those things. A global pandemic, that was for our ancestors. We have medicine, we're smarter than that. It will never occur here. It's, it's unthinkable. Institutions we thought would last forever. Denominations we never imagined would shatter. Fears of losing beautiful and treasured buildings, stone upon stone, representing the permanence of God, all will be thrown down. Jesus, first century Jews, those who read Mark's gospel when it was new, ink still wet on scroll, and us. What has Mark been saying to us all year? I think that what Mark has been saying is actually here in these last words of the Mark cycle. Because all will be thrown down is not the final word. Instead, the scene shifts and Jesus and his friends are no longer walking out of the temple, but they're standing on the hill on a rocky hillside across from the temple, looking at those shimmering stones, those huge rocks that are that building that is the house of God. And Peter, James, and John, Andrew asked him privately, tell us, tell us when this will be. How, what, when? How will this be? When will it be? What will be the sign that these things are about to happen? Now, if, you under, if we understand this, what they're asking is, it, how, how do we have a sign so we can run away? So we can be safe? So we can protect ourselves from this? Because if this is going to happen, we do not want to be here when this occurs. And Jesus says that this terrible thing will happen People will be led astray. There will be false leaders. There will be wars and rumors of wars. And then, in the midst of all of these warnings, in the midst of their fear, Jesus says, but do not be alarmed. What the heck? Do not be alarmed. I'm terrified. This is like spending all day on Twitter. This must take place, Jesus said, for the end to come. For nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes, there will be famines. But this is the beginning of the birth pangs. And there it is. Mark's gospel has no nativity narrative because the entire gospel is a nativity narrative. The gospel is not just concerned about whether Jesus was descendant from Jewish kings or whether or not Mary gives this terrific prophecy of the rich being cast down. No, Mark's nativity gospel is the birth of the kingdom of God and how we will get through this age to the next stage, how we are going to move through the birth canal from this time of suffering to the time 
when God's presence will shine through the whole of the earth like a light that never goes out, when the glory of, the God, of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, when the new Jerusalem, where there will be no more tears, will come and dwell among us forever, where God will make God's habitation in human hearts. This is the birth narrative that Mark cares about. This is the advent that Mark cares about. And you know what Mark tells us? Birth is hard. Birth is hard. That this move from one age to another, from the end of things, from the death of the old, into the birth of the new, will be marked by and attended with suffering. And that is a really hard thing to tell you lovely people on a beautiful, sparkling Sunday morning in Texas. But that is the thing. Birth is hard. Hannah knew that in the Old Testament. Birth is hard. She was loved. She had everything, but she didn't have the one thing that baby, that son that her husband dreamed of. And so she was brokenhearted. As a woman, she was essentially cast down because she couldn't give the one gift she most wanted to give. It said she was full of the greatest anxiety and despair. Birth is hard. And then Samuel is born. Endings and beginnings, rocks and birth, they go together. Several years ago, I was at Ghost Ranch in New Mexico, and I was standing in the Zen Garden, which is, overlooks the shining cliffs, which are these beautiful red mesas uh, at, at Ghost Ranch. And I was holding in my hand a rock from the Zen garden, and I was praying, and I felt very grounded, one. I felt the sense of permanence of the rocks, of the cliffs. When you opened your eyes, you saw the shining cliffs. No cliffs more deserve that name than those cliffs in New Mexico. They're 165 million years old. And there I was, feeling all of that, the presence of God, the rock, the stability, when all of a sudden, the earth underneath my feet began to move, and there was a sound like no sound that I have ever heard in my entire life. I thought that there had been an explosion in Los Alamos where one of the bombs had gone off accidentally at the nuclear labs. And I dropped the rocks that were in my hands and I looked up to the sky and there was no mushroom cloud, but there were clouds. What had happened was a, a facing of the shining cliffs had fallen off, and these huge boulders were tumbling down the side of the mesa, hitting the ground as if being thrown by the gods in heaven. And everything was moving, and as those rocks hit the ground, dust, dirt, soil, it all exploded. And so there were clouds, clouds of dust arising from the earth, not a cloud of destruction in the sky. And I held my hands against my face and I went, oh my gosh, it's not about death, that, earthly, that, that shaking that I felt, but instead it's about creation. Because that's how creation happens. We're here in this church at the edge of a great university. You all know this. Creation happens when one thing 
transforms into something else. Those rocks are going to become soil. Those rocks are going to be carried away by wind and water, and they will become fertile soil that sometime in the future someone will plant food in and feed their village. Life, birth, a new earth comes from that which is thrown down, cast off, and crashes when we least expect it. C.S. Lewis referred to God once as the one who shatters. The birthing God is a shattering God. Anyone who has ever given birth knows this. I've only done it once, but I remember lying in that hospital room with the beautiful baby. That's the part we love to talk about. But my body was shattered. It would never be the same body that I had before birth. That's the work of God. The one that shatters in order for birth to happen. And C.S. Lewis went on, say, could, went on to say this, could we not say that this shattering is one of the most important marks of God's presence among us? No coincidence that C.S. Lewis wrote during World War II. And that's just what I think Mark is saying to us. A new world is being born. And it may feel to you like everything that is stable, everything that is permanent, everything that once housed the presence of God, that it's all being destroyed. But that's the birth. The shattering of this age happens so that a new one will be born. In Deuteronomy 32, 18, Moses refers to God as the rock who bore you. The rock who bore you. And then went on to say to the people of Israel, you forgot the rock who gave you birth. And so Mark has spent a year reminding us, a terrible year, a truly terrible year that we have been through together. On top of a terrible decade, following a terrible decade, and all of the unexpected things that have happened that we never thought would happen, all of the things we thought were unthinkable. Mark is saying to us, do not be unmindful of the rock who bore you. Do not forgive, forget the God who gave you birth. It's a beautiful, hope-filled, surprisingly comforting mystery for a suffering people. None of this is in vain. We are the generation of midwives, those who know the pain of the birth canal. And our job is to remember that God attends all of this and endings give way to new life. As we enter into Advent, that is well worth holding in our hearts. Amen.